Hey everyone, welcome to Simplexity, where we simplify the complexities of life and bring a little curiosity and contemplation to meaningful, sometimes difficult conversations. I'm your host, Allison Stoner. Last week, we began our conversation with architectural technologist Idris Sandu, and we entered the world of using engineering and design to create operating systems in our own lives that equip us for the present and innovate for the future. I received hundreds of DMs after everyone listening to the episode and saying it was one of the top favorites, so if you missed it, definitely start there and then jump over here. Today, we are continuing our dialogue on the G genius frameworks behind his company's Ethos DNA, Spatial Labs, and Halt, and how you can set your value and walk in your power just the same. Enjoy! Welcome back! We're here learning all things tech, engineering, design, you name it. It's only just begun. So, Idris, let's chat engineering and design further. Part of being a self-identified architect is understanding and utilizing engineering and design in order to create efficient systems and infrastructure. For you, some of that infrastructure is digital. For me, it might be engineering content and community experiences. For everyone listening, you are architecting in your own sphere with your daily schedule, relationships, career, and beyond. So consider yourself included in this exploration. Engineers CDIO, they conceive, design, implement, and operate. To think like an engineer means to use this systematic thinking to solve your daily challenges and unlock the intrinsic values in them. There are hundreds of kinds of engineers, including mechanical, chemical, civil, electrical, management, geotechnical. As for design, the role of design, arguably and debatably, of course, is to improve the visual appearance and function of messages and information. Like engineering, there are tons of fields within design. I said fields. I meant fields, but also fields. They give me the fields. Mm -hmm. From industrial to environmental design. Within all of these subgroups, there are characteristics that separate what is deemed to be good design versus bad design. Now, having acknowledged that there is inherent bias in all systems that are monocultural or homogenized, you can see how the principles of engineering and design can already cater to certain eyes and tastes and functions that assist certain groups more than others. But there's also a need to make sure that if there's information on good design in one place, we spread it to every population and at least give them the same chance to experiment with the principles and yield their own inventions. So you mentioned Dieter Rams. Rams? Rams? Rams. I think I mean, if you're German, it's Rams. But if you're say, American, it's Rams. So he's famous for his, his 10 principles of design. You mentioned some of them as a reminder. This list states that good design is innovative, aesthetic, it makes a product understandable, it's unobtrusive, it's honest, long-lasting, it's thorough down to the last detail, it's environmentally friendly, and actually it's ironically something that has as little design as possible, meaning less is more. Now consider your life as a, a product of your mm -hmm. own engineering and design and rewind to hear the 10 principles again and ask yourself how you've implemented each, if at all, to architecting the life that you love and live daily. I guess, what principles of engineering and design do you recommend we implement into our own lives? As somebody that's um, really studied data rounds from the perspective of a philosopher more than a, you know, engineer, in fact, in the Gary Huswit directed Rams documentary, he himself said if he could do this all over again, he would instead be a landscape architect because he realized that even though they created amazing products at Braun and Vizzo, the process of creating these products wasn't always environmentally friendly. So you have something that exists in the industry as we know it now where companies talk about how they create this end product, which is environmentally friendly. But the creation of the product and the manufacturing processes that go into the making of the product aren't environmentally friendly. And in some cases, the offset ratio of how much carbon, carbon footprint, footprint was generated is even way worse than to offset the creations. To me, I think there is pro there's four principles that I, I think every person should embody. 
the first would probably be principle number six into their lives. If I, again, you said if I was a product, right? Principle number six states that if I'm not wrong, that good design is long lasting. Good design is not fashionable. Fashionable is trendy. It's about a specific time period. And people will go back to reference it, but good design or the fabric of what em embodies me isn't something that I want. When somebody thinks about a specific thing that had happened at a time in history, then they go back to learning about what I just did or talked about. No, I want my philosophy to be a way of life in a way that people integrate whatever it is in their daily lives. Or even if it's not centered around me, whatever we create becomes something. Then I think after principle number six, I would go to principle number seven, which states that good design is honest. Truth as at the integrity of everything that I do. I neither try and say things that I don't understand, nor do I make promises I know I cannot fulfill. And that's what principle number seven is all about. It says that good design, because we are designs in ourselves, good design should not make a user of it or a listener to it or a viewer of it a promise it no, it cannot keep. You know, I should not make a, a vacuum that also can make pizza. You know what I mean? It just doesn't make sense. After that, if these were my recipes, mm -hmm. uh, I would also regard principle number nine. And I believe principle number nine deals with environmentalism. I'm a huge environmentalist. Therefore, when I create technology, when I create whatever it might be, I am focused on the democratization of that. A lot of people ask me, why do you do a lot of AR work over VR work? Well, the limitations of VR far offset the limitations of AR. With AR, any phone that has at least a camera can view right. it. Right. And phones have pretty much been democratized throughout the world. And camera phones have been democratized throughout the world. VR technologies are very difficult to create unified experiences because each one, some have sensors that you need to buy aftermarket, some have that, and it's hard to create a singular experience for them. When I create AR experiences, at most, my limitation is computational power. How much can the actual device display? How many polygons can it display without lagging? But it's never for the technology in itself, right? It's more about the limitation of the current software. In that way, I would equate environmentalism or principle number nine as environmentalism in itself should also mean democratization and access, and especially in the digital space. And then principle number 10, which states that good design in itself is as little design as possible. Uh, our goal is to make the juicer of information, right? We want to be able to take all these different nutrients and all these different things and all phosphorus and all these different materials, put it in a blender and give you a smoothie. That's why like, you know, people love like the food in the bottles. It's, it's so much easier to digest than physically chewing and eating, even though it's good for you. Those, those four things are what would inform my thinking principle number six, which talks about good design being long lasting, never focusing on a trend, never trying to make what I do fashionable. Making it cool, yes, but coolness that escapes the ravages of time. Principle number seven, which talks about good design being honest, never putting myself in a position where I'm giving information and talking about something that I have no knowledge on or att attempting to make it as if I have knowledge on it, or more importantly, promise that my knowledge will give people the ultimate North Star. It's simply a guide. Uh, and then I would go to principle number nine, which is about being environmental, making sure that when I create, no matter what it is, one, I focus on the democratization or the spreading. I don't want to use words that feel very like diplomatic or political. So I would say the scale of things, but also making sure that I'm equally offsetting. When I talk about something bad, I'll make sure that I talk about, even if I'm talking about a problem, I'll give more solutions than the problem. If we were to take problems and solutions that I give on a graph, you would notice that if we plotted these, if the, let's just say, uh, problem being phones being this or whatever, I would say the problem has an X coordinate and the solution has a Y coordinate. And you would always find that the Y coordinate that I choose to give always surpasses the X coordinate. Therefore, it's always going up. And you would notice that if we put that on a graph, for every time I've spoken about a solution to a problem, it might not be the solution, but it's a solution. And that a solution is closer, if you put it on a graph, literally, right. it's closer to the solution than it is to the problem. And then finally, to be able to create the, you know, the message in the bottle, the, uh, the juicer effect, which is to take the high level of conversations that I'm exposed to when dealing with large scale companies or you know, the largest celebrities and bring that down to 
quote unquote, the average person. And by that, I don't mean intellectualism. I mean access and information, similar to what you had mentioned before as well. We must take these principles and not say, these people won't understand this, or they're not capable, but give them the opportunity to interpret it in their own way and inform their own cultures or whatever it is from those. So yeah, that would be me in a re recipe. If Dita Rams was the, you know, the baker, those would be the... Uh, <laughs> Yeah. Excellent. That reminds me of two things. First, I was speaking with my coach about how I, I wanted to be able to be a bridge between the ordinary and the extraordinary. And of course, I'm not talking about judging things as being cool or less cool or good or less good, um, but more so focusing on the bridge aspect of being an intersection where people of all everythings can come together and exchange that information. But the difference between building a bridge where you're laying your own body down and having people walk across you and having you know your own life sacrificed that's one version of being a bridge another version is to build the bridge and name it after yourself if you really need to have it named and, and be involved in that way and that way there is a longevity to it there is a different kind of infrastructure and I feel like that really goes back to what you've been saying this whole time in our own personal lives it's not always about wearing ourselves even thinner by being the bridge itself but building the bridge that we can then all walk across and it doesn't have to be at anyone's expense other than you know our willing investment because we believe in the vision so i have a question about your creative process because i find that as a creative and an entrepreneur myself there's a certain timeline between having an idea trying to find a solution for it and deciding if I need to quit, pivot, or try again. How many revolutions of an idea are you personally willing to push through in order to find a solution versus the times you're just like, yeah, no, this, this isn't the one because it's not coming to me. We got to find a different approach. Yeah, I'm a very sort of proportional, numerological sort of thinker. And so I think about well, how we have a 24 hour time period because we measure how long it takes the sun or the earth to revolve around, you know, the planetary alignments. So everything I do is pretty much like in alignment with that. And in, in a lot of cases, before I come at a solution, I will reiterate around it probably around 24 times, right? And optimize it several, several times. And I do this to get the closest because again, we're all human. All we're saying is that as an individual, you always have some level of bias. Whether you choose to learn from those bias and involve other people and the, the level that you're really focused on optimizing till that bias is kept at as a minimum, that's the true test of time. And so for me, whenever I create something, first time, there's a lot of problems. Two, there's less and less and less problems as I go to a point where I feel, based on my discernment, that I can finally put this work out here with the notion of it being observed or identified. And even as I create and after I create, there's still case studies being done on how people react to what I create and then going back and optimizing it. So the chances of you having marginal bias or biases are marginally low. They're really low. If you factor in the work that you'll put in to get to the least biased, you know, it's like LBD, least biased denominator. <laughs> like <laughs> the fact that when you get to that, after you divide and divide and divide in the same way that you would do the least common denominator, when you get to like the least, actually, I'm gonna write that down so I don't forget. Yeah. Uh, when you get to the, <laughs> when you get to the least biased denominator, then the people will help you get to in an even atomic because it's like you know uh, atom is the smallest known particle to human but you have the quarks and the bosons and all these things in there and the people help you view the bosons and the quarks and everything so in that capacity i, I think that's really where i'm really like centered on right and you mm -hmm. had said something really important and i think i've never heard that and it's so great uh when you said you know i can build a bridge and have people walk across from it you know, we live in an age where no one has to be a martyr anymore. Technology allows us to, I mean, come on now. You know, it's like, if anything, people use that in a negative way. People go on Instagram, go troll somebody, go create a whole new Instagram account just to leave a comment and troll it. I'm sure you've experienced this, right? It's like people daily. just want to, <laughs> daily, like literally new account created four hours ago just right. to give one comment. But what if we flip that and what if we focused on praising people mm -hmm. what if people created new accounts to anonymously thank you 
for mm-hmm. anonymously let you know how they appreciate and much they appreciate it without bringing attention to themselves. And not a compliment. Yeah, I'm not a compliment, right? I'm not a compliment. That's that's like really cool. You know, when I think about like even what you just said, it, it cuts back to that. It cuts back to really just understanding like why am I really here? And when I create and when I iterate, the iteration is based off of a yearn or a desire other than mine. If I look at like the way that my, and I'm, I mean, I'm still young, but I've been able to create a space for myself where, I mean, at 23, I can say that I've been in tech for a decade, mm-hmm. you know, since I was 13. And I've rightfully worked very hard to get to where I am. And I've built a life of quote unquote access and comfort. But I don't wake up and create things for myself. I, I'm not focused on, inv- and to me, the difference between an invention and an innovation is, An invention is really built to assist one's own will and one's own desire. Hey, you talk to your friends, you're like, yeah, I invented this new like color palette or this nail gloss or whatever. It's like, you know, no, and it's so cool. It's for you. But then there's also those opportunities where you spread that to other people so they can do it for themselves. And that's the real innovation. When you become that bridge by, you know, building the bridge and then naming it or whatever, if you choose to name it for yourself or whatever, uh, versus being the bridge and in some ways it's limited because what happens when the bridge collapses or what happens when you can't take it and what happens when you're not here? But to go back to your question around my creative process, I really have a lot of, you know, you don't have to take it literal when I say 24 revolutions around product, but take it metaphoric. By that, I mean a lot. Like think about it a lot. How many times do you think? A lot. You know that 21 seven. It's like, I think a lot before arriving at a, even if it's a creative project that I post on Instagram or whatever it might be. So by the time I post it, all it gets is love. There's no hate (laughs) because I've thought about, well, if you don't add this to it, somebody's going to say Magic Leap tried that or Microsoft tried that, you know? So it's really just about doing your best to not necessarily please everybody, but rightfully give everyone the opportunity to feel pure emotion, right? not biased emotion. Because that's the thing. When somebody hates on you, they're not actually hating you. It's not that they don't like you. Mm-hmm. It's that they're tapping into an energy force that they haven't healed from. And mm-hmm. maybe we, we look and we say, hmm, well, maybe if I optimize that, they wouldn't have been able to tap into that energy. Mm. <laughs> That's a cool point to circle back to curating the experience, having looked out for all of the possible ways someone might misinterpret the intention of your creation and protecting it so that it can be as purely experienced as possible. And I too do the same thing. Sometimes people you know, see my process and they're like, you can't please everyone. And I'm saying, it's not actually just about pleasing, it's about protecting the vision and doing my research to understand who's going to be watching this anyway and beating them to their own thought process with a solution. And also saying, hey, I recognize that this obstacle is something you might normally place here, but I'm actually going to identify it and then remove it so that you really can just take in what I'm making for you. Everything that you just said was built around solution-oriented thinking versus Mm -hmm. problem-based thinking or identification. And here's how we know that. Somebody comes up to you and says, Addison, I really don't like what you said or what you did or the creativity. What do most people say? They say, that's not my problem. (laughs) That word in it's, that's not my problem. So whatever they say comes from the perspective of problem-based thinking versus solution-based thinking. But you saying that you beat people to it with a solution, now have people being like, oh, because we focus on the solution, you know? Versus that's not my problem. You go like, oh yeah, that, that, that was because it had solutions. You know yeah, I mean? <laughs> right. I try to even help train and guide to the best of my imperfect ability, my online community and how to respond to comments by people who throw shade or, you know, seek to maybe cut deep in some way. Uh, I like to respond first with thanks for your feedback. <laughs> you know, because it's like, okay, this is a process of mirroring and you're identifying something within me that either is upsetting to you or something about yourself that you reject or don't want to accept, whatever it is. And so thank you for sharing your version of reality and events. Thankfully, we can have this both and quantum experience. So here's where my reality sits. I love that quantum both and experience. I love that. That's so you should write that down. I don't know if you do you say that oh, often. Yes, yes. Okay, we talk yeah, about that all the time. I'm sure people are sick of me now. But I'm like, hey, this one driving force has changed 
my reality and experience and ability to deal with people. So there are so many gems that you've shared in every answer, but particularly in this most recent one that I hope when people are listening, you really take a look at your life and who you are and consider what ways you can design and redesign and optimize and iterate and all of that to actualize your fullest potential in the greatest service of humanity and the planet and the cosmos. So one last question and then just the really simple, simple final one. So it, it's an A and a B. A is you are the founder and owner of three companies, uh, Ethos DNA, Spatial Labs, and Halt. You've directed music videos. You just dropped a music single. Congrats. I listened to it. Everyone go check it out. Under the artist name Code Switch, correct? Yes. With no I. C-O-D-E-S-W-T-C-H. Mm -hmm. And the song's called 7 a.m.? Uh, yeah, I did, we did one 7 a.m. And then I just dropped a new one with Vic Mensa called Algorithm. Ah, okay. So yes, go definitely check those out. And this shows that your creativity and your architecting happens across sectors. And you are an alchemist who reuses and repurposes materials from one place for new endeavors. I actually have a short film series called Alchemy, which is... Wow. Uh, the same thing, to take elements that happened in our week and transform them into gems. So in doing this, you've learned the art of assessing and setting your own value when you walk into a room and when you begin a project or decide where you want to put your energy in the day. That is something that I think gets in a lot of our ways. So I'm wondering if you have any advice, how can we practically assess and set our value in our workplace, relationships, personal growth, so that we stop playing small and we walk in our power. You know, how can we remove our excuses? Yeah, I think everything that I do, I, I think about it from the perspective of offering a solution, but more importantly, creating it from the perspective of a creator and not a consumer, mm -hmm. right? Um, I would rather, and that's the position we've been setting ourselves up with, even though I have, you know, I have a partnership with Facebook, and other tech companies, I don't want to just go in and pitch an idea and they try and use that idea with somebody like a Rihanna and it doesn't work because people can see through BS and they don't want a tech company to tell them what they want. I would rather form that one-to-one -one communication with the culture and say, hey, I respect your values and I understand what you guys have been hearing for a long time. I'm going to go partner with Rihanna. <laughs> and create this experience for you guys and you guys will love it. And it's like that identification of that solution where for everybody listening to this, it's not a hypothesis. It's been tested on a very large scale. I mean, I, I tweeted earlier, like last year collaborating with Just Water and creating an AR experience that got over 3 million views. The Kobe tribute we did, 3 million views. The Rihanna experience, 3 million views. Migos, 2 million views. Like these are very scalable things and it's worked time and time again and it hasn't failed us yet. But I think for anyone that needs advice in terms of assessing their own value, the people that come in when we want to talk about threats, right? The threat isn't me telling people, learn how to code. The threat is in saying, build your own operating system. Learn the machine code, right? I mean, again, it's like, and I don't mean it from a literal standpoint, but that's where it's like, oh, no, 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 no. You're supposed to teach people how to use Flutter, which is Google's programming language. You're supposed to use React, which is like Facebook's programming language. You're supposed to use, you know, all these languages that were created for you to stay and think, because again, it's literally like a mirage. Think about like, you know, when you would look at the sun hit the ground and you would think that it was like a wave, mm. but it actually didn't exist. That wave is what gets people in the realm of excuse. Do you understand how hard it is to build an operating system? Yes, I understand. But you know who else understood that? Steve Jobs. Mm. And they created, well, Unix, they acquired Unix, and they created their own operating system. You know, Stott, it was very difficult to build an operating system in a way that it wasn't even democratized in the way that it is now. Bill Gates. And guess what he did? He built that operating system. You know what I mean? You know who else like thought operating systems weren't the wave? Well, technically, this isn't really an operating system, but they kind of did. Elon Musk with the Tesla OS in their cars, and they built that. So I think we just get into this ability that we cannot do this or it takes a long yes it takes a large team it's not easy that's why not everyone's been able to do it it's not easy to scale but if you focus on the right thing you can create an ecosystem for every single product that i'm working on we're creating systems around it and people will see later what the smart beacons we're working on and the hardware and things that i can't really disclose too much the smart glasses that we're working on that we just teased the other day we're building these things so my only advice if I've said anything or if I could say anything is simply 
give solutions around or from the perspective of ultimately creating something new rather than changing that which already exists. Yeah, that's excellent. And recognizing your value will lead to a sense of confidence and competence. And I think it stems back to something we shared on an episode with brain coach Jim Quick, which is there may be a, a growing period where you have to expand your capacities. So if that's where you're at right now, when you're looking at your your end goal and you're saying that is a really hard thing to accomplish, well then break down what are those skills that you need to build or identify what those skills are and find someone who you can partner with, who gets the vision. But the more that you can empower yourself from the ground up, the better you can also just detect who will and will not truly get your vision when you're trying to, you know, make some of those larger asks with either funding or investing or whatever whatever that might look like down the road. Yeah, and if I could add, I absolutely agree with, and I'm aligned with everything you just said. And I would also add to it that the part that I probably didn't give a lot of clarity on was the value, right? Valuing yourself. Now, if I grew up in an ecosystem where people were used to seeing technology left and right and in abundance, the skill sets that I'm practicing now would be seen as something like they're cool, but they wouldn't be seen as extraordinary because people are used to seeing aspiration all around them. But that's the problem with places like the Valley and Silicon Valley, that you're so used to seeing this that you think that the world operates in that perspective, when in reality, you're in a 1% bubble. And most people are making smart toasters and smart phone cases that give you shots of espresso. And mm-hmm. Although I think that's cool. It's like, you know, that's one more thing I have to charge in a day. My right. phone case, I think because I've been able to be in this cultural space and go back to what we said about hip equals hop, which started the conversation about hip hop, because I am a hip hop kid through and through and grew up on whether it was actual hip hop or whether it was a neo Afro futurism through people like Fela Kute. These are the things I that I involve. I love Fela. These are the things that I think about and incorporate in the technology that set me apart from the rest. I've never been in technology or never been in a room where I said, I'm the only person of color in this room. I've been like, oh, I'm the only person of color in this room. You know what that means? It means I've been exposed to something that nobody else has been exposed. Therefore, I have solutions that nobody else is able to give because they didn't mm-hmm. go to those things. So it's always really realizing that like in every room that you walk into with every solution, understand the power of what you can experience. And that doesn't always have to mean race. It doesn't always have to, it could be community. Mm -hmm. It could be where you came from. It could be about a demographic you're representing that no one has seen. I identify with, for example, this color or this gender. And so I want Apple to update their emoji to reflect that. How about I just go create a new emoji keyboard that's built on that, you know? Mm -hmm. And so then you would really realize that majority of the people that would often complain about those things would then be like, I don't want to do that though. (laughs) It's not that I think it's hard. It's that I don't want to do it. And so Mm -hmm. you really have to like put your aspirations where your mouth is. You Mm -hmm. know, that's something that I do a lot. Like I never come out and say any problem without giving a solution or saying something that's closer to the, to the, uh, to the solution than the problem. And I think we need more of that. And when you do that, then you can realize the power of arbitraging. I won't free. I'll never forget three years ago. I went into a studio with Nipsey Hussle and we did a, sort of like an interview with Gary V. Gay, Gary v. And he's a very good friend of mine. And I remember him being like, you figured it out. He's like, you, you got it. You understood how to arbitrage something that in this space would have just been cool. In this space is extraordinary. And you can guide way more people to understanding how technology actually works than mm-hmm. these people that think that they're so great and their mantle of responsibility is teaching people how technology should work. Right. You're one of the people that guides versus the other that imposes. Mm-hmm. And that's how it works right now. That's why people have such a difficult time with large scale corporations mm-hmm. and confining because we're not given a choice. An operating system is a amendment of the constitution of your phone every single time that you have no say as to how it should work. And if you don't want to use it, you know, and I'm again, I'm, I'm going to keep this very non-political, but if you don't want to use it, leave our country. That's the equivalent of the operating system of the phone. If you don't, go switch to Android. Go switch to whatever it might be. But we're not given that opinion. So, oh boy. <laughs> it's out. <laughs> like, And that's where we will put the official ellipses there so people can <laughs> dun, 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 dun. further in and, uh, and do their own research. The part <laughs> B of that question is simply... How can people find you, support you, even pitch ideas to you or learn more from you and and the resources you seek out? 
you know, Spatial Labs is a hub that we're creating. And Spatial Labs is a hardware and software company, but we're a collaborative company and we're also an agency. So we work with entrepreneurs and so many different people outside of just celebrities to bring ideas and imaginations to life. So, you know, you can follow us on social media. You can visit the Spatial Labs website visit us we're actually gonna about to redo our website it's gonna be super cool ethos dna e-t-h-o-s and then capital dna is also on social media as well or you can hit me up and i prefer emails because my dms are crazy even if mm -hmm. i wanted to i can't respond to all of them we have a nonprofit arm that for the sake of you know a lot of things going on we haven't opened to the public but very soon we're gonna open it to foresee these visions like what we're working on in africa and, cool. and, and you know things of that nature um, but yeah, social media, I'm of the youth, connect with me, because I'm considered Gen Z, but I can also uh, fit within a late millennial, because I was born in 1997 versus 1999. Mm -hmm. um, but I think about like, you know, like Gen Y, or, you know, like baby boomers being like, you know, a young brother like you doesn't have business cards. And I go, uh, principle number nine, uh, good design is environmental. I don't want to be chopping trees down. You know, I'll give you my, I'll airdrop. <laughs> <laughs> you know my card to you so uh our website social media is the best way to connect with us perfect oh it's so good uh, everyone make sure you follow and keep an eye on idris thank you so very much for joining me today and and sharing such valuable insights for how we can better architect our world and design a better future for all. Thank you so much for giving me this space. And I'm glad that through this and even this dialogue, we've not necessarily, I might not know what food you like or what your favorite colors are, but I'm aligned with, and I know through conversations like this, what values you are. So I'm thankful that through this, I found a new friend uh, and I've found many friends through your platform now. I'm mm -hmm. so thankful for you for even identifying and honoring and, and seeing what we're doing and thinking that was worthy of even spreading. So thank you so much. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. Thank you indeed. All right. Well, we will wrap up here and I will take another quick break and then we'll jump into our weekly mantras and let you all go and take a nap so your brain can process. <laughs> all right. All right, it is time for our weekly mantras. So I will repeat each phrase twice and then I will leave space for the third so you can repeat it out loud. Here we go. First, I replace my problem-based thinking with solution-oriented thinking. I replace my problem-based thinking with solution-oriented thinking. Second, I can build a bridge of opportunity for others without being a bridge that is walked over. Hear me out. I can build a bridge of opportunity for others without being a bridge that is walked over. That's a really helpful one for me. And lastly, another strong one, I only make promises I can fulfill. I only make promises I can fulfill. Excellent. There is so much that we covered here. I really hope that you'll you know, add some time in your calendar, in your busy lives to hear this and listen to this episode a few times and just chew on the wisdom. Thank you as always for listening. Be sure you share this with loved ones, friends on social media, especially if you post anything, your favorite takeaways, just tag Simplexity Podcast and me, Allison Stoner, and I'll be sure to share it to my platforms. And again, thanks for listening. If you haven't already, please take just a couple seconds. It does not take more than 30 seconds to give us a nice rating and review. And by us, I mean me. We're building this community one person at a time and your feedback is phenomenally helpful. So thanks again. And I can't wait to share more gems with you next week on Simplexity. It's anything but small talk. Peace. <laughs>